Hello, everyone, and welcome to HALT's Virtual Skills Lab. This is an online global forum where you can connect to like-minded go-getters and hear from our world-leading HALT faculty. For those of you who are joining HALT event for the first time, let me give you a bit of a background about who we are as a school. HALT have designed a school that focuses on future of education. We deliver leadership skills, we challenge your mind with future challenges and provide your first-hand experience. We currently offer an undergraduate program, five specialized master's programs, one-year MBA program, and a flexible EMBA program. And today we are joined by a faculty member, Professor Rob Anthony, who will be delivering a class on something that is super relevant right now and is leadership in crisis. Well, take it away, Professor. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, Mikhail. And hi, everybody. Uh, glad to see we've got a very kind of uh, international audience here uh, today. And um, I'm, I'm kind of excited to be talking to you about this topic. Uh, I'll start, I'll introduce myself. My name is Rob Anthony. Um, behind you, you see the whole Boston campus. I'm uh, out of Boston and I teach uh, in all the whole programs. Uh, I've taught the MBA, the executive MBA, the masters at all of the whole campuses. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, crisis, uh, crisis leadership. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. And uh, I'm uh, <clears throat> excited to be joining you. And, and so let's get into it. Uh, Obviously, we're all uh, dealing with a global pandemic, and uh, that makes this, I think, a, a relevant time to talk about a, a topic like this. On the screen, you're going to see the various, uh, cr you know, I'm going to call them crises that I have worked through in my career, kind of lived through and worked through, and uh, maybe, uh, maybe you guys have been working through uh, some of the ones other than the coronavirus, I'm guessing that this won't be the last. Uh, we're all uh, certainly kind of suffering through this, uh, we're, we're some more than others, uh, quite honestly. And, uh, you know, the, the idea is to look at this as an opportunity to kind of uh, evaluate the world around us, see what's, what works, what doesn't work, what we can learn, and how we need to build our skill set uh, going forward. Um, we're going to be talking about leadership. And, I, you know, I believe that really nobody can teach you how to lead, but what, what we can do is kind of teach you what to pay attention to so that you can reflect on your experience and grow as you go and teach yourself uh, how, to, how to lead. And our research at Halt indicates that the ability to kind of lead and do and not just analyze and know is an important thing that em employers at all levels are, uh, are, are looking for. And um, crisis, I believe crisis leadership is a, a relevant topic because uh, crisis leading in, in a crisis is in a sense, the high rent district for, uh, for business and doing hard things well is how you make kind of an exciting career. Uh, doing easy things well is kind of a ticket to entry, but doing hard things well. It's how you really move forward and get where you want to go. And um, more and more, the business environment is um, starting to look like a crisis environment. There's a term VUCA, and VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And it's kind of a common narrative that's out there, uh, but more and more uh, operating the business environment is the world is VUCA, whether it's in crisis or not. And so the skills that are re required now are more and more skills that you need um, to be successful, you know, kind of post-crisis or in going forward in whatever you're going to be doing um, in, as your career goes forward. So uh, another way to say it is if you can't remember history, you're condemned to repeat it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a couple of past situations that have been kind of business emergencies and we're asked the questions, we're gonna ask the question, what can we learn from those about what the keys are to uh, leadership? It's gonna be a little bit interactive. I'm gonna ask you to post your own thoughts a couple of times on the chat. 
uh, we're going to do a little bit of a poll um, as we go. Well, let's start with what's a crisis. Crisis is something that's uh, unexpected, uncontrollable, and says an academic named Charles Perrault, who's uh, studied this in detail, unavoidable. And uh, the you know uh, business world is complex. More and more companies are uh, trying to work with uh, suppliers in a smart way, working with networks of other companies, working with their customers to innovate, and where things are complex and interconnected, that's where when things go wrong, cri crises happen, right? And in, in a sense, we see that with the current, uh, you know, current pandemic, things go wrong in a small uh, in a in a small way in one part of the world, and next thing you know, uh, populations are involved, the whole world is involved, health systems certainly, uh, business systems of all kind really nobody is uh, untouched because of this, you know, kind of interconnection of the world and the complexity of how things operate and how things transmit. So um, two, two key questions really uh, that we'll focus on today is why are situations like this challenging? What is the challenge for leaders? And secondly, really, and very importantly, how should leaders respond? Uh, what should leaders do? And again, um, I, I believe this is provides a roadmap for how you, you want to kind of develop, develop your skills going, uh, going forward. So I'm going to ask that we start with a chat and I'm going to uh, stop my share, share here and I'm going to uh, read through what you what you've got going in the chat. I'm really going to ask you as you as you think about crises in a more abstract sense, or you think of specifically about what you're going through, what your companies are going through, what your societies are going through right now, what makes these dynamics challenging for business uh, leaders? I'm going to give you a minute, put some thoughts in the chat, and then I'll share with you some, uh, some thoughts. Don't see anything in the chat quite yet. Thank you, Melissa, for jumping in first. That's leadership. Uncertainty of employees. Excellent. You're working virtually. No question about it. If you're lucky enough to be working, uh, we're, we're working vir virtually. Distance has a penalty. Globalization used to be a good uh, metaphor for that, but really there's distance of all kinds. People are socially distant from each other. They can be on different floors and be distant and working from home. We're seeing the complexities of reduced communication, uh, slower, uh, slower speeds, uh, working with people who are uncertain, the strategy of the company, certainly what's What's going on? What's going to happen to us? What's going to happen to me? What else? What else you got? Thank you, Melissa and Thomas. Who else has a thought? Anything? Anybody with us? Mo motivating to be proactive, especially when they are um uncertain no no question about it so there is uh uh what motivates a person to join a company and a lot of times you know people think about money what enjoy, motivates a person to stay with a company a lot of times that's work relationship what motivates a person to give discretionary effort um in a pandemic it's hard to get that uh you know, discretionary uh, effort. Money won't do it. The relationships won't do it. What does uh, what does do it? Uh, the 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 kind of supply chain uh, dislocation. No, uh, no question. So um, I'll offer a couple of thoughts. Um, 
managing the crisis and the day-to-day uh, very uh, certainly. Today is a day when, in my country, people are voting for president. Who's going to be president of the United States? A politician we have, he's governor of New York, says, in emergency situations, we end up focusing on issues we never thought of before. Some of the challenges along these lines, uh, I'll let you read this. I won't focus on all of them, is uh, you don't you don't understand necessarily the scale of the problems. Events speed up. There's information overload. Uh, negativity bias can kick in. There's a tendency among humans to see negatives more clearly than positives, see negatives in more specific, specificity. Equal negatives and po- positives, they will tend to balance out the negatives. Uh, they'll see ne- negatives as being more relevant. So how do you maintain uh, optimism? Social media, so the rumor mill activates. Uh, bad news can travel quickly, and as was started out, start and I believe it was Melissa that started us out. Anxiety levels are very, very high. There's an academic uh, named Carl Weich, uh, who it's a German name. I noticed that there's somebody from Germany on with us uh, today, who studied crises, and one of the crises he he said he was simply. Um, some smoke jumpers, people who jump from an airplane into a forest fire in Montana. And most of, in this incident, is called the Man Gulch disaster. Most of the, uh, the, the smoke jumpers died. And he looked at why, why was it that this organization of smoke jumpers unraveled? And what were the key challenges for lead leaders? And he really identified two. And one key challenge was that when people are anxious, you have to take the perception, take the perspective of um, not only yourself, but of those around you. And anxiety levels of high, are high. And when anxiety levels are high, they have a hard time making sense of what's going on around them. So they lose sense of what are we doing? How are we doing it? How are we going to work together? Uh, what constitutes good? So what I called sense making. And then secondly, the structure tends to uh, disintegrate. The notion of how we're going to work together. What's my role? What's your role? What are we all supposed to do? And Vike said, when that happens, uh, those two things work together. So the more people are anxious, they can't make sense, the structure disintegrates. The more the structure disintegrates, uh, the more people get anxious and can't make sense. So in this situation, some orders were given by the, by the leader, and um, they didn't make sense to the smoke jumpers. And once again, most of them died. You can read about that. Uh, you can read about that in an article called The Collapse of Sense-Making in Organizations. You can get it online. It's a very good read, although an academic uh, read. It's a, little bit, uh, it's a little bit exciting. So how should leaders respond? This is a little bit, a little bit more of the question for the day. And this is a kind of a good halt way to do things. Instead of me telling you or giving you theory, let's watch a leader in action and say, what can we learn? Um, and the, the leader, and we're gonna talk about two situations, but the first is I'm gonna show you a little video. And the video is gonna be about three and a half, four minutes long. We'll watch a two minute clip and then we'll watch about a minute and a half clip. And it's a video of uh, Johnson & Johnson, big, as probably you know, a big company, global, global company um, from New Jersey in the United States. And they manufacture, one of their products is Tylenol. And some of you may know, uh, a while back now, there was a, a crisis where Tylenol, uh, there was poison put in Tylenol and several people died in Chicago. And the CEO at the time, his name was James Burks. And James Burks got busy and got to work responding to the crisis. And we're gonna see James Burks in action. And he's gonna, for example, reference the credo and the credo is the mission and the values of Johnson and Johnson. He'll talk about that at the end, but we'll see him uh, talking to the press. 
We'll see him working with his leadership team. Uh, we'll see him talking to uh, some TV hosts, right? And I'm going to ask, what does he do well in terms of his response that we can uh, that we can learn from? Um, and I'll ask after the videos, we go ahead and post in the chat. So I'm going to share my screen again. And again, there'll be about a, a two and a half minute clip and then a one and a half minute clip. Good evening, this is the CBS Evening News, Dan Rather reporting. A bizarre and terrifying story today in the Chicago suburbs of Arlington Heights and Elk Grove Village. A 12-year-old girl and two men who are brothers are dead after taking poison capsules of extra-strength Tylenol. The fall of 1982, the Tylenol poisonings occurred. The first thing that popped into my head was, uh, how could this possibly have happened at our plant? A warning against the use of Tylenol. No one knew for days if the poison bottles were limited to Chicago. But even as the police and FBI began to search for clues, Jim Burke already had concluded that all Tylenol capsules, not just those in Chicago, but nationwide, should be recalled. Johnson & Johnson will no longer manufacture or sell any capsule products made directly available to the consumer. While this decision is a financial burden to us, it does not begin to compare to the loss suffered by the family and friends of Diane Ellsroth. On behalf of the entire Johnson & Johnson organization, I have expressed our heartfelt sympathy to Diane's family and loved ones. We asked James Burke, Chief Executive Officer at Johnson & Johnson, to let us watch behind the scenes as the story develops, and he agreed. Let me, let me take you through the logical sequence. Number one, this shows us very clearly the consumer was waiting to hear from us, and when, when she heard from us, she responded positively. Great. No question about it. So until we bring the third leg in, which is commercial television advertising, we're not using all the weapons available to us. What she is saying is that she, she, she needs reassurance and we're giving it to her. What she's saying is the most positive reassurance you give me is a tamper resistant package and we're going to give it to her. And what she's saying in spite of that, and we have to track this as we go, is a deep down I'm concerned. Your, your conclusion is since she's concerned, we ought to go out and sell her. There's nothing more offensive to me if I'm frightened than somebody tell me I ought to buy their product and I know I ought to buy it and I feel I ought to buy it, but I can't. Well, I got a lot of credit for that. But the fact is, my job was made not only simple, but there wasn't anything else I could have done. All right. Uh, now we're going to see him uh, fast forward a little while later, uh, see him working with uh, the, the public. Johnson & Johnson announced its new safety packaging. This package has three separate barriers to entry and affords the public the best protection we could reasonably devise. The outer box has glued flaps. Then there's a red seal, as you can see, around the outside, which uh, is the second barrier. Uh, and then that's all right, look at that. Barrier. And that's the third barrier, which is a simple. Well, this will obviously cause a rise in the price of the product. No, we're not going, we're going to absorb the price because we think it's good business too. We had to make uh, hundreds of decisions on the fly. Uh, like hundreds of people made thousands of decisions. If you look back, we didn't make any bad decisions. Really, we really didn't. Those thousands of decisions all had a splendid consistency about them, and that was that the public was going to be served first because that's who was at stake. So the reason people talk about Tylenol when the Crater discussions come up is that the Crater ran that because the, the hearts and minds of the people who were Johnson & Johnson and who were making the decisions in a whole series of disparate companies. We organized every company in the United States to help solve the problem. They all knew what to do. Okay, 
Let me uh, stop that before we go into the next thing. Outstanding. So um, here is my question. Excellent. Some of you guys. Okay. Uh, what did he do well? Go ahead and put it in the chat. What did what did Burke? What did you see that was might have been effective? Clearly, a lot of thought was given to what the solution was. Tanvi, trans, uh, tra transparency. People are going to understand the truth, right? And they're going to draw their own conclusions, whether you're transparent or not. So he built trust by being transparent. Good answer, Melissa. Immediate response, taking responsibility, community over profit, listening, stakeholder input, cared about the consumer, didn't raise prices, right? All oh, really good stuff. So uh, let me, um, uh, yep, took, res took responsibility, right? Uh, wasn't a victim, didn't sit around licking his wounds, oh, poor me, jumped into, uh, jumped into action, uh, according to the, 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 fir the first piece, before the FBI uh, could jump into action. Share with you a little bit of a model, three things to pay attention to. Uh, this is, are some things to think about in terms of how you lead, what actions you take, how you lead in a crisis more generally. And it's not a bad way to think about leadership uh, specifically. Um, I want to talk about this for a second, and then I'm going to get your input on a poll, and then we're going to talk about another situation. So really three uh, things, and we hit them all in the chat. One is there's a certain attitude you have to have, certain mindset. Second is when there are problems, you need solutions. And third is you need broad engagement around those solutions and understanding. Uh, and as as Vike said, to keep the anxiety low and to keep the structure intact. So mindset, solutions, and communication. Those are the three keys. And you see the practices within that, that leaders need to be active, that they need to be goal-focused without ego. Uh, ask for help. Uh, Burke talked about the, the credo and the whole community came together and make, made decisions. We saw intense teamwork with uh, rapid uh, learning. When things don't work, move on quickly to the next thing. Uh, we saw transparent communication um, that was truthful with public, uh, with public commitments that were given with confidence and uh, calm. Um, all keys, here's what I want to ask. Oh, no, well, here's what happened. So through the management of this, of this, particular, of this particular crisis, over time, this was very successful. And in fact, two things happened. One is that the analgesic, the market for Tylenol, this is just one way to, um, this is just one different type of pain reliever. The market for this type of pain reliever grew and Tylenol's market share grew, right? So the crisis turned out to be a huge opportunity and the effect of handling of it a big, uh, a big, a big boom. So, think about the um, the three keys that I gave you: mindset, solutions, and communication. And I want to ask you to reflect on what do you think was the most important aspect of Burke's leadership response. And then I'm going to ask you to reflect on your companies and your situation. And what is, out of the things that I showed you, we can only list 10, by the way, what have your companies been strongest at, best at, 
And what have your companies been weakest at, worst at? And I'm going to release a poll and I'm gonna give you a minute and there it is, it's launched. And I'm gonna ask that you go ahead and answer the poll. What do you think was the most important aspects of Burke? And then what are your companies strongest at and weakest at out of the specifics? I'll give me a minute to do this. I don't see any voting. I don't know if there's a technical problem with the with the poll. There we go. Three people have voted. Oh, very interesting. All right, good stuff. I'm going to give you another 20 seconds. 15, 10, 5, 4. All right, the polls closed. All right, I'll show you the results in a little bit. Um, very interesting, always very interesting. And again, we have a big election. Everybody's very nervous about it in my country. People have strong opinions and um, uh, we ran our own little election here. So um, I wanna talk about another, uh, another situation here. Um, writer in my country says, in times of crisis, we find when you do hard thing, another, hard things, another word for it is crucible. So difficult circumstances tend to bring out the best of us and or the worst of us. And if it brings out the best of us, we learn a lot. And um, we do things that we're never thought, uh, we never thought possible. I wanna talk about a different crisis situation and this time talk about it from different, you know, kind of angles. So. Um, lest you think that crisis leadership is all about what the CEO does, we just saw um, James Burke. I want to argue that leadership happens at all levels. Leadership happens on the front line. Maybe those of you who are on this call. Leadership happens among experts, functional experts, marketing people, uh, engineering people product development people, manufacturing people, service delivery people, the experts, the, the directors, right? Um, leadership happens at the top. So um, to make this point and to illustrate what, it look, what leadership at different levels looks like, let's talk about the Chilean mining disaster. So um, you, some of you may recall, some of you may be too young, about eight or nine years ago in Chile, a, a mine collapsed and almost 40 miners were trapped underground. 33 miners, actually. There's a movie called 33 that depicts this, right? You can watch it on Amazon Prime. So, uh, and the miners were trapped 2,000 feet below ground. And it was some of the most inhospitable terrain in the entire world. And there'd never been a successful rescue in such a situation. And for 17 days, the miners were, tra were trapped and they were in a little piece of, a piece of the mine shaft and nobody knew whether they were alive or dead for 17 days and they didn't know if they would be rescued or not. Then through the effort of the engineers and the rescue teams, they were discovered. And when they were discovered, they started working with those above ground 
and for another 40, it was 69 days overall. So whatever 69 minus 17, 52 days, 52 more days, um, they were trapped underground trying to facilitate their own rescue. And I wanna argue that leadership was displayed underground by the experts and by the company and political leaders. And I wanna say that <clears throat> you can learn from this no matter what position you hold. So the miners themselves, how did they show leadership? First of all, they, they trusted in their teamwork. They trusted in the fact that they knew each other and they had worked together before and they trusted in the fact that they knew their jobs. So the, in, in Vike's terms, that structure never really uh, disintegrate. Second, the miners' leadership emerged within the group. And there were two leaders. One was Urzua, uh, the other was uh, Sepulveda. And Urzua was calm and Sepulveda projected hope. So the, the miners sought out and accepted leadership based on what they needed in the mine at that time. They came together and they worked through conflict rather than getting consumed by conflict. Um, they created roles and a structure and they made decisions very carefully that ultimately allowed them to work constructively with those above ground once they were uh, located. A good role model for you If you're on the front line and you want to lead is Luis Urzua. And uh, why Urzua? First of all, he did have some formal authority. He showed his competence. He let his competence do the talking. He did his job well. He didn't himself panic. And he didn't try to take charge. If he'd have tried to take charge, he might have sparked conflict. He let other people come to him and he stayed calm and he maintained, and he maintained structure. So uh, staying calm, doing your job, uh, letting people come to you, um, keys to lead on the front line. Functional leadership. Let's think about the engineers. Engineers worked very, very hard. They, they tried all kinds of things that had never been tried before to get these uh, miners out. They had multiple, si uh, multiple experiments running simultaneously. They cooperated with NASA in the United States, the Aer Aeronautical Space Agency, the US Navy and others to learn things that would ultimately help them. What did they do? First, they tried to learn as much as they could about the problem. They quickly got ideas at the, at the table. They reached out for help wherever they could get it. They ran multiple experiments. They, uh, and they were very structured and clear in how they worked with stakeholders. And they put a perimeter around the rescue effort so those who were implementing their plans could work interrupted. A good role model, if you're a functional expert, was is uh, is uh, Andre Sugare, and why Sugare? Here's what was said of him by a senior executive. He's technically competent, but he's strategic also. Um, he's patient. He listens, and he can speak frankly, truthfully with everyone. It's not about power. It's not about politics. It's about getting the job done, and so that's what it takes for a uh, functional expert. And then the uh, political, uh, political leaders, like the Tylenol situation, the political leaders uh, uh, got involved, they stayed involved, um, they, uh, they, they, they made the lines of authority clear, they created relationships with outside bodies so the technical experts could could uh, work with them. So they facilitated ne the networks. Uh, they made public commitments. They said, 
these miners are going to be rescued dead or alive. Uh, so they signaled that they were going to stay on the case until it was uh, over. And then they absorbed the uh, interference uh, or conflict from the outside sources. So those who were working in the organization could focus on the task at hand and didn't have to deal with uh, the conflict. Um, the, the head of rescue operation uh, described their the job uh, thusly, we planned and we thought about as many scenarios as possible. Leadership from the top about the things that we talked about, uh, taking responsibility, making public com commitments, um, staying on the job until it's done, coming up with solutions, facilitating network building and transparent uh, communication. So some takeaways from these examples that crisis leadership is about getting back to normal, but it's also about innovation. It's also about making things, harnessing possibilities to make, make things better uh, than they were before. That the best leaders don't just play defense, to use a sports term, they play offense. And they focus on understanding things, goal-directed solutions, and then assembling resources to uh, make it happen. They think about what's gonna happen next. They help people around them make sense of the changes. And then they create a structure so that change can be uh, implemented. So, but the map is not the terrain, right? This little model I gave you isn't always what happens in reality. So let's talk about uh, your organizations. I'll share the results. So you can see the results of the poll on your screen. Most important aspects of Burke's leadership um, you guys said it was mindset. We had about 50 people on this morning said it was mindset also. 58% um, this morning said it's mindset, 60% of you. The idea is that thinking comes before uh, acting. Paul, we talk a lot about mindset. We talk about a lot about the growth mindset or seeing uh, effort as important to development and not just talent. Um, idea is that uh, mindset kind of unlocks uh, the possibilities for the other two things, but um, uh, some of you are, uh, you know, I think that communication comes first, that um, action precedes uh, mindset. You know, psychologists say that sometimes you can be happy and smile, other times you can smile and be happy, right? So a little bit split there. I think the answer, the correct answer is all of the above. The question's a little bit fake. It's just to get you thinking about the uh, uh, these three things. Talk about your companies. Strongest part of your company's response. Thirty percent of you. It's a small group. Manage uh, managing expectations. Um, good stuff. And a lot about uh, the communication cluster. Right, so those of you who said communication is important, my guess is that uh, many or most of you were um, the ones who have had a positive experience with your organizations for communication. In terms of what has been uh, working, some of your organizations, uh, leadership has been on the back foot, right? And I'm on the board of a couple of companies and it's, it's interesting that my experience with the pandemic from that, that, uh, that standpoint is that senior managers have, have, have often taken a while to uh, figure out, oh my gosh, what's the, what are we gonna do? And how do we find opportunity? And what does this mean for us, right? And for them working hard to understand and solve the problem, time moves very fast. But what they don't recognize is that for everybody else, time is moving very slowly. And people are saying, oh my gosh, 
what do we do? And anxiety sets in and structure disintegrates and uh, panic sets in that uh, distance has its, uh, ha has its cause, right? Um, and, and so uh, when they're working very, very hard, they think they're doing the right thing, but the organization views them as inactive and not, not owning things, right? Um, and, and so this, uh, um, these things work together, but becoming active, uh, signaling ownership and communicating ownership, uh, you know, kind of quickly, even if that means, uh, folks, we have a problem. Here's what we know about the problem. Here's what we are doing about the problem. Join us in figuring out what, what you can do, what we can do, because we need leadership at all levels. Uh, and we'll continue to work together as we, as, we, as we sort this out. That has been the most effective response uh, that I've seen to the pandemic. And really any other kind of response, uh, you know, tends to exacerbate uh, the problem. So I want to end on a slightly different note, um, on, a, on a somewhat uh, positive note. And um, the, um, on this day when Americans are voting to see who's going to be, who's going to be president, right? Uh, there was a president in my country 50 some years ago, uh, more than that named John F. Kennedy. I'm from Massachusetts. He was from Massachusetts, who observed once that in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One is for danger, and the other is opportunity. Uh, I don't know if that's correct, by the way. I assume it is. I don't know if it is. I'd like to ask that you reflect on that for a second. And I want to ask the question, what can we learn from the current pandemic that can produce longer term good, either for ourselves or our companies or society in general? What can we be learned about this? That's positive. I'm going to give you a minute. Go ahead and put your thoughts in the chat. What do you think? What can be learned? has to be a positive and optimistic group, right? Thank you, Teen, or Tyne. Apologize if I got your, your name wrong. We're, wa we're watching science in action globally, aren't we? Uh, that's kind of, that's an interesting thing. My uh, kind of PhD work was on science, scientific innovation. Learning about remote work. So I'm in I'm in Boston, and there's um, a lot of a lot of technology companies in Boston, and uh, people who bet on the future. And the future has sped up, right? It's happening. The future is coming in. We're learning to use technology for work, and that's happening fast. Agility, fast decisions. Good stuff. Anything else? How to live every day, Mariana said. So we're learning how to live with less also, aren't we? I mean, um, and, you know, I don't know about you, but you learn to adjust your priorities and uh, know what to know, know what to value, right? Uh, what's important? What is less important? Um, all very, all very good stuff. So I would urge you to have a positive outlook. Um, I would urge you to uh, be aware of 
uh, your circumstances as either a frontline worker or an engineer or a senior manager in the mine, whatever your uh, situation might be uh, at present. And think about, observe the world around you and think about what is working now, because what is working now in terms of the kinds of leadership that's required is going to be more and more the kind of leadership that's gonna move your own career uh, forward. And uh, with that, I will ask you if you have any questions, if you have any questions, pop them in the chat and we can uh, have a little Q and A and then I will hand you back to Mikhail. What questions do you have? If any. Okay, no questions, fantastic. Uh, Mikhail? Yeah, thank you, Professor. That was extremely insightful and absolutely super relevant. I hope everyone who joined enjoyed it. And our next webinar will focus on how leaders can develop performance during the times of crisis. And it will be taught by Professor Michael McCarthy. If you'd like to register for that one, please go to halt.edu slash virtual skills. And you also get a chance to see what we have scheduled throughout December. And the recording of this session will be sent to you in, by email in the next few days. And again, if you don't have any questions, then we'll end this. Thank you for joining. Goodbye.